thank you for um, coming here this afternoon instead of going back to see Hong Kong, you know, that's which I encourage you to do. I'll try my best to keep you awake and uh, I hope that's, you know, you all learned something here as well. So uh, let's get started. The title of the talk is Right Once, Wrong Anywhere, but for GPUs, you know, so um, I started my career in Java, you know, when um, at that time the, the tagline was Right Once, Wrong Anywhere. And uh, um, I was really, you know, because I was just out of school at the time, you know, I was really didn't really understand what's a big deal about that because, you know, there's only two type of CPUs as far as I'm, there's only one type of CPUs as far as I'm concerned when Java first came out, right? It's just the x86, the Intel CPU. So at the time, it's right once run anywhere mostly refers to the operating system. So the developers, they typically don't have Windows. So they compile the application, they develop the application, but then they need to deploy on, say, uh, a Linux server, uh, Apache server, or something like that. So Java sort of, sort of serves as an intermediary and uh, to go across different operating systems. And uh, we can witness that it has tremendous success coming from that, I think, fairly narrow use case. Um, fast forward to 2019, we started the project called Wasm Edge. A lot of people ask us, how is it different from Java? You know, because that sounds like the same thing. You have a virtual machine, compile something to the bytecode. I always tell people, you know, that's uh, all the big difference is that, you know, we, we, we don't need Java, the language. We, uh, we don't need the garbage collection and, you know, things like that because we use, say, Rust and the language itself take care of the man memory management and, you know, things. So we can have a very lightweight, small um, runtime that's, that is suitable for a lot of, uh, you know, lightweight use cases, for instance. Uh, serverless functions, you know, microservices or even, <clears throat> or even blockchain smart contracts, you know, things like an edge you know, edge functions, things like that. So it always lingers, you know, to say, you know, that's, it sounds like, you know, you're doing the same thing for the 20 years, you know, that's your first start in Java and then you started something that's very similar to Java, <laughs> you know, that's, uh, so it's only until I think um, uh, two years ago, maybe 18 months ago, you know, um, uh, we have, uh, at least for me and uh, for many people in our community that we have come to realize that Wasm can actually be a lot more than, say, Java for Rust, you know. It actually takes the right once run anywhere idea to a whole new level that we want to do things that are, you know, because we are in a world where there's a lot more hardware, you know, there's, even in CPU, there's three different CPUs now, you know, not just the, the Intel uh, x86, you have the, um, the ARM CPUs and you have the RISC-V, and even within each family, you have different uh, add-ons. So for instance, if you look at, um, you know, the, the, the processing unit within the Intel CPU, you have, you have CMD, you have AVX, you know, there's a large number of things you can turn on and turn off, right? So CPU compatibility has become an issue, especially if you are in a high performance computing environment, you want to take, the, take advantage of all the features the CPU has to offer. And then with the AI and large language model come along, there's a strong demand for GPUs. And uh, as we can see, uh, even with NVIDIA, you have incompatible versions of CUDA. You have CUDA 11, CUDA 12, and we are, all, we are all the way back to the same thing that we started. Developers, they all have a MacBook, you know, something like that, or a Windows machine that has no GPUs. It's only a CPU machine. So they develop applications. They have no idea whether, the, uh, whether they compile the application, whether the application would work when they upload it into a production environment or the cloud, right? So the, the, the testing and development, again, has been separated because there's no unified runtime that allows developers and, uh, and uh, um, you know, um, and, and IT managers to run the exact same binary application anymore. And it's not just uh, people need to recompile the application, like in the old days when Java, you know, Windows and Linux, the people need to write applications in a way that is wholly different because the, on the Mac, the GPU API the SDK is very different from the one that used by NVIDIA in CUDA, right? So not only you need to, um, you basically need to rewrite your application to use the new API in order to take advantage of the, <clears throat> take advantage of the GPUs. So <clears throat> that's what it brought us here, you know? So we thought, you know, there's a, there's a unique opportunity for a WebAssembly or WASM as a, as a, a lightweight virtual machine format to, um, to address this issue the same way uh, Java was able to address those issues 25 years ago. So, you know, that's, that's where we are. And uh, so, but before we go 
deep there. You know, let's take a step back at the, you know, um, the typical architecture of large language model application today. You know, so people say, you know, why do I need cross GPU compatibility? Because I'm not using GPU at all. I'm just using an API. The API provided by ChatGPT, the OpenAI, or Entropic, or you know, uh, maybe my IT department started something with Olama that runs on GPU machine. But from my application point of view, I only need to interact with the large language model through the API. But my prediction is that things like that would soon change because those setup is good for prototyping purposes. You know, the loose coupling between what we call the loose coupling between the application and the large language model. The truly useful application has always been you, are, you need tight coupling. You need to exactly match your application. Um, the way you write application has to be exactly matched to the lar large language model that you chose. Meaning, if you chose a model that is, um, you know, fine-tuned and better at, say, programming, that you would feed it with a very specific knowledge base about programming. And uh, with, if you want to build a pro knowledge base about programming, then you have a whole new requirements for embedding, for how to chunk the, 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 the knowledge text, or original text, so that they don't break up in the middle of a, uh, a code listing, right? To be able to understand what uh, language the code is written in, and you know, things like that. So there's a number of things, there's a large variety of things that you have to um, write in your application to be very specific tailored to the model so that it can take advantage of the model. So that means you should, uh, de developers should bundle those applications together and uh, should not just treat the model as another API, someone else problem to worry about. You know, that's uh, it's open eyes problem. You know, let them deal with the GPU stuff. That means developers would need to think about how to take advantage of GPUs from their new generation of applications because I, I, I believe the new, um, you know, the, the AI application that actually works needs to t couple the, the, the application itself with the large language model that you choose, meaning that puts the large language model and the application into the same software package, maybe in the, even in the same container, right? You know, so that gives the rise to the need of, you know, so I have a, um, you know, I have application that with large language model embedded in it, I need a GPU and I need a runtime to run the large language model within my application, taking advantage of the GPU. So I need my application to be portable, right? To be, to be able to properly package it and port it across different environments. So the problem number one is, you know, uh, when people are faced with this kind of type of problems, you know, the, the, uh, the solution they typically have is why not just use Python? Because, you know, um, all those models are training Python and PyTorch. And, uh, um, you know, so the, the model file and the format and all the tools, the libraries and, you know, things like that, in high likelihood, they are available in Python, right? But Python's biggest problem is that it's very complex. And uh, it's, it has far more than you would need for inference because it's designed for training and for scientific research and for that purposes, right? And uh, even as a scripting language, Python is not portable anyway. You know, so the way that you write Python that's for the Mac and for the NVIDIA is different. The code has to be slightly different, right? So if you look at the dependencies that Python, Python or PyTorch has, you know, I, I, know you, I don't know if you can read the, the, the screenshot there. It's a, it's a screenshot from, um, you know, Docker Hub. It's a, um, it's a standard or the minimum image for, uh, for PyTorch on, on Linux. Um, the image itself is like three gigabytes, okay? And the, the other one, you know, more developer friendly is 80 gigabytes. So the image itself without the large language model, okay, the large language model adds another five to 50 gigabytes of space. The, the runtime, the Python runtime itself has enough stuff that is eight gigabytes. And if you add more stuff to it, if you embed this, you know, you know, eight gigabytes plus five gigabytes, you know, it's like 13 gigabytes. You know, you, you, you embed this whole thing into your application, your application will soon become very bloated. And it doesn't address the portable problem anyway, because when Kubernetes sees a, 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 a Docker image with Python with, um, that is specifically tailored to, uh, uh, say, NVIDIA, it would have difficulty to just orchestrate it because it would need, um, you know, a software change in order for the Python application to use a different GPU card, right? So, you know, so that's problem number one. You know, is that, can you do it with Python? You can, you can use Python to embed a large language model into your own application. You know, just, uh, uh, you know, because there's different language bindings for Python, you know, that's, uh, so you could do that. But it's, uh, it's very undesirable, you know, that's uh, at least to me, right? 
So the problem is such that you know uh, you, you often see tweets like this. You know, uh, so uh, Greg Bachman was, uh, I think, the um, CTO or, or, or the president of OpenAI, right? He, he said much of the modern machine learning engineering is making Python not to be a bottleneck, right? You know that to figure out how to do this in Python, right? You know that's uh, so he uh, another day he. You know, that's almost the six months later, he, he, he sent out another tweet. He sent out all those tweets, those tweets frequently, right? His current status, installing dependencies, that's specifically referred to Python's depend, the complex dependencies. There's gigabytes of it, right? And uh, then another guy said, you know, that uh, AGI would be built with Python. Let that sink in. And uh, um, uh, Elon said, Rust, right? You know, so I think there's a, a fairly um, a strong consensus that production applications should not be built in Python. Uh, in fact, this is what we see in large internet companies. If you go to, say, by, uh, ByteDance and, you know, um, go to Alibaba, go to Google, go to those places, and to say, uh, ask to see their inference stack, you know, I think it's mostly C++. There's very little Python, right? You know, there's, uh, because of those no, uh, well-known issues with, uh, with the complexity of Python, and uh, um, with all this complexity, 99%, you do not need, I mean, the 99% of the stuff is needed by professors and researchers who build the models. If you just want to use the model, you don't need those, but you know, it's a package in a way that you have to download it and install it. So then that leads to the problem scenario number two. It's the developer experience is terrible. It's the same thing that's, you know, um, when, we started Java, you know, so all those years ago, I was a Java champion, you know, so we had the first, we started the first open source Java application server company and we were bought by Red Hat. So I stayed in Red Hat for a couple of years until my best, uh, options all vested. So what we did is that, you know, uh, at the time we tell people, you know, Java is right once run anywhere, you know, so you can, um, you know, you can move your payloads around with regardless of your CPUs or, you know, or operating system and all that. And most people thought we were crazy, you know, because they thought, we were doing that only because we were too young and uh, too naive, right? You know, that we didn't see any, any of the, the production workload because to them, the production workload is Linux on, C, on, on Intel CPUs. What's, you, why do you need write once or anywhere? You know, that's you just compile for that platform. You know, that's, um, so, but then it turns out it solves an entirely different problem. It solves the problem I described early in my talk is that developers have Windows they don't have Linux on, on their desktop. So they compile it on Windows and then they ship the binary to the, to the, to the backend and the, ba the backend Linux system wouldn't be able to run it. We have the exact same problem now, is that the developers are typically not using Linux, NVIDIA on Linux platforms or AMD on Linux platforms. They are using consumer grade laptops like, uh, like this Apple, right? And uh, you know, so they, you know, you have the huge overhead of have to rewrite, recompile, and retest for every platform. And if you look at how the cloud native infrastructure is set up, Kubernetes is not designed to recompile your code for each of the targeted deploys. It's just designed to just take the binary artifact and, and stick it to the new machine, right? You know, so it's, uh, it's so the, uh, every, every link in this paradigm has been broken by the introduction of those large complex GPUs. And there's lots of them. You know, there's not, not just NVIDIA GPUs. You know, every single um, cloud providers, the semiconductor providers now have their own GPUs or NPUs or TPUs. You know, that's whatever they call it, right? You know, they all have their own hardware. You have to adapt to all of them. They all have a different SDK that you, requires you to compile to specifically for their hardware, right? So I think this, this problem is already getting out of hand. This problem is already of uh, a very urgent pain points, right? So, <clears throat> to deal with this, you know, in the past we dealt with um, the um, Linux to um, a Windows compatibility by introducing the, J the Java virtual machine. So there's a very, um, you know, um, old saying in computer science is the old problem in computer science can be solved by another layer of indirection, right? You know, so we provide another abstraction. That abstraction we call it WebAssembly Swasm, right? So let me, stop here and give you a demo because I think I have talked enough. You know, I said all these things about, you know, that's uh, how, how great this is, right? You know, but, you know, let's see it for ourselves. So we have, um, so here I have an application that I, that I built with Rust. I, I'm going to show you this application in a minute, but you can see, you know, um, I'll show you the build file, cargo.tomo. So it, it has, 
some dependencies, you know, so what it does is that it's a Rust application that does AI inference, to, uh, give you a chatbot on the command line, okay? So it loads, a, uh, it loads an AI model, ideally on the GPU, but it also works on CPU, and it gives you the, you the user interface to have, uh, allow you to interact with it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna build it, right? Cargo build, and I'm gonna build it to WebAssembly. So it's gonna take a minute to compile, you know, because um, if you have used Rust in the past, you know that uh, uh, the compiler does a ton of work. You know, um, you know the, the, the thing that I like most about Rust is that if it compiles, it most likely it's correct. You know, so it's, uh, it's rare to see something that is compiles but has runtime error. You know, unless logical error, of course, but say things like memory error and you know, things like that. So if it compiles, it's, uh, it does, the, the compiler does a lot of work and that make it, you know, um, makes the job on the runtime much easier. So it's compiled, okay? So we have the application that's compiling to Watson. So if you are familiar with Java, it's the same like a Java application that's compiling to JVM bytecode format. So I'm gonna copy it. I'm gonna copy it to the, to my um, home directory, right? You know, so I'm doing all this in a, in a Docker container inside my, on my Mac, okay? So it's not, it's simulating, so from inside the Docker container, it sees Ubuntu Linux, which is the operating system that's run on this container, but also sees the uh, ARM CPU. It doesn't see the GPU on my Mac. So in the compiler environment, as far as the compiler environment is concerned, I have no GPU, okay? <clears throat> so I go back. <clears throat> I see this WASM file is the one that I just downloaded. And I, I just compiled. <clears throat> And we can see it's, um, you know, it's five megabytes, right? You know, so it's, um, you know, reasonable size, okay? So I can run it inside this, this, um, this um, a Docker container, but I wouldn't, right? You know, because I want to show you the cross-platform capability of it. So what I'm gonna do is that I'm gonna copy it from the container, out, out, copy it out of the container into my local machine so that I can run it on the Mac and show you that it actually runs on the Mac CP, uh, on the Mac, GPU. So I already have the command here. Uh, no, sorry, it's um, huh? Sorry, let me do this again. Um, I think I have the script written somewhere. Yeah. Okay, so I I already did that. So I use the Docker copy, right? Copy from the container to the local machine. And uh, I'm gonna do this. Okay, successfully copied. And uh, what I'm gonna show you is, okay, so you can see it's the same, same application, it's the same size, right? You know, it's the same size as this one. And uh, um, what it does is that I copy it as a binary file, I just copy it. There's no recompiling, there's nothing. You know, it's just uh, this binary file being, com being, com being um, you know, um, copied out of it. And I already downloaded a large language model. So um, when I prepared this talk, I thought which model I should use. And I decided to use the model that Microsoft just released yesterday. You know, it's called the uh, uh, 5.3.5. You know, it's, uh, it's um, uh, a fairly small, but also very uh, highly scored large language model. So what I'm gonna do is that, because this is a WASM file, so I use WASM Edge to run this, but I pass it a bunch of parameters. I pass it the model file name, the prompt template, you know, like I said, you know, those, um, the, the model needs a lot of parameters, needs the application to fit it. The model needs the application I run it to fit to, 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 fit to this model, right? So I started the application. Ah, why am I? Oh, model file is not fine, so it's, uh, it should be in this directory, sorry. Okay, so the, this starts almost instant, instantly, right? You know, that's, uh, um, so the WASM, uh, the WASM runtime started the WASM application. Now, um, I, I've heard that the model is pretty good at generating code, so I'm gonna ask a question. Say, write me a Rust function that determines if an input number is prime, okay? So it's an easy 
it's an easy thing. So the bot thinks, you know, the, the first question, the, the first answer is always slow because the, the model is five gigabytes. It needs to load the five gigabytes of stuff into memory and then it starts. But when it starts, it goes really fast. It goes faster than it can talk, right? You know, if I talk like this, it's about three to five tokens per second. But the, the, the bot does it much faster. The bot does at least 20 tokens per second. The reason I'm showing this is because that shows Without doubt, this is handled on the GPU. Because on the CPU, it's gonna be a lot slower than I can see. We're gonna have one token per second, something like that, right? So, but you can see, it's actually pretty good. You know, that's, uh, so this is the Rust code it gives. You know, it's, um, um, it determines, you know, it, has, it actually has some interesting optimization. It says, you know, if it's number one or number two, then it's prime. If it's above number two, then I'm gonna skip over all the even numbers, okay? Because even numbers are definitely not prime. But then after that, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna get a square root of the number that I, I entered and then iterate all the way up to that number and check every one of them, um, every check on uh, every odd number against whether they can be divided by some something else, right? So, you know, that's, I think that's a pretty classic Rust implementation of this particular algorithm. You know, that's, uh, you know, I just said this in a incomplete, uh, natural language, right? So I think this model is pretty good. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say translate, um, no, no, rewrite it in Python. Please. Typically, you don't need please, right? You know, that's uh, so the bot thinks, and the, the, basically the bot takes the, uh, you see it goes faster this time because it doesn't need to load the five gigabytes of stuff into memory anymore. But it does need to know what I'm referring to when I say rewrite it. What is it, right? Now it says, it's, uh, um, it sees the Rust application that it generated it, uh, above. So now it knows that my intention is to translate that into Python. So it does all this. Um, so it's almost a line by line translation of the Rust application to Python, right? You know, so uh, again, this is, um, um, you know, I, uh, to recap what we have done. I rebuilt this, I built this application in the Docker container on this Mac. As far as the Docker container is concerned, there's no GPU, okay? So it's generated a WASM file, a five megabytes WASM file. I use Docker CP to copy that WASM file into, my, into this Mac and then run this application. And because, although the application was built without any GPU knowledge, it now sees the machine it runs on has a GPU. That has my Mac M2 GPU. So it's uses that GPU to run the model and then generates all these answers. So as far as I'm concerned, I think this is pretty good. So I want to go one step further in this demo. So I'm gonna control C. And, and uh, what I'm gonna do is that I'm gonna copy this whole thing into, a uh, copy this WASM file into a remote machine that runs on NVIDIA GPU, okay? So in, in this entire building process, um, you know, um, it's all done on the Mac. Uh, while, I tell, uh, while I'm saying, you know, it doesn't have any GPU knowledge, you know, that's um, people may be doubtful, but you definitely doesn't know anything about NVIDIA. So what I'm gonna do is, uh, let me see if I can find the command. Uh, maybe it's here. Yeah. So I have another machine that's running on Azure that has a, um, a Ubuntu Linux with a NVIDIA GPU. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do the SCP command and the copy of this WASM file directly into that new machine. Okay, so I can do this into the home directory. This is uh, five megabytes. I hope it's gonna go fast. Yeah, go fast, okay. And now I can do, I'm gonna SSH into this machine. Okay, so I SS into this machine and I can see this file, hopefully. I see this file here. Again, the same file I built from my Docker container on my, on my, on my Mac, right? It's the same size, it's the same file I copied to my Mac. It's the same file that I copied to this um, uh, remote machine. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop whatever services that I have on this machine, okay? And, and now, um, instead of downloading um, a large language model, what I'm gonna do is that I'm gonna um, uh, use the large language model that's I already downloaded on this machine. So let me copy and paste the command again. It's on the NVIDIA machine. 
So instead of using the Microsoft um, you know, Fire 3.5, which was released yesterday, I'm going to use a more famous model, that is uh, MetaLama 3.1, which is uh, Facebook released um, you know, a, couple, a couple weeks ago, which is uh, a highly regarded model. So as you can see, it's, uh, I passed a bunch of um, parameters, like the model file name, the, um, the chat template, how do, you, how do you construct the chat in order to interact with the model. So I do. Um, okay, let me see. It does have it. Oh, it doesn't. Okay. It only has Llama 3. It doesn't have Llama 3.1. So let's do that. I'm sorry. All right. So see, it's uh, uh, Tesla T T4. You know, that's uh, it's using the, um, uh, the, the the CUDA device. Now I'm going to ask it something else. You know, because this model is not particularly known for um, being good at, say, um, um, uh, generating code, right? So I can ask an everyday question. It's uh, let's say, plan me a two-day trip for sightseeing in Hong Kong. So you can do, tell you something that you can do with the weekend, right? It is, you see, the, uh, the CUDA GPU is a lot faster than the Mac, don't you see that? You know, that's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it spits out text much faster and loads much faster because I think, you know, um, because the GPU itself has much, um, you know, has much a faster memory, you know, so on the Mac, the CPU memory and the GPU memory are shared. So to load this five gigabytes model into the, C, uh, into the Mac M2 CPU takes multiple seconds, as you can see. There's a multiple second pause at the beginning of the conversation. But as the GPU, it's almost instantaneous because that's why the GPU was so expensive, right? You know, that's why the, the media stuff is more expensive than the, the similar stuff on Mac, uh, 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 Apple produces. That's for that exact reason, right? You know, so the, the GPU is much faster, but you can see the, does answer make sense? I think it does. You know, let's go to the Victoria Peak, you know, for the, uh, for the morning scene, you know, that's, you see the view of the harbor, you know, afternoon, you go to the temple, you know, whatever. And you can say, I can even say, please translate the trip plan to Chinese. Okay, so, you know, my terminal is not, I'm sorry, you know, that's, <laughs> oh, 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 I know why. You know, that's, uh, um, this one works much better on Lama 3.1. You know, so, so the major difference between Lama 3 and Lama 3.1 is Lama 3 is only English. So, you know, there was a Chinese uh, fine tune for Lama, uh, for the Lama 3, uh, for Lama 3, but Lama 3.1 is the one that they incorporated all those uh, different languages. So I'm sorry, you know, that's, um, um, or even knows to traditional Chinese. I didn't tell it to traditional Chinese. Okay, anyway, you know, that's, uh, but then this would be a good exercise for you to try on your machine, right? You know, just to download the latest, um, you know, um, um, uh, Lama model and you will be able to, you know, so uh, hopefully I have demonstrated that I built this thing in a, doc, in, a, in a Docker image with CPU only. I move it, move the file without recompiling, without rewriting onto the Mac and it's automatically understands that I need to use the Max GPU, the M2 GPU, and the generate response for me. And then I move it to a, a media machine, uh, Azure, and then it automatically knows this machine has a media GPU and it generates text for me, right? You know, so, so that's, um, so let's go back to the presentation. That's, hopefully that's, that's, um, So yeah, that's, um, you know, so uh, we have the entire script on, on GitHub. I, I'm going to upload this presentation to the, um, to the uh, conference website so you can follow along as well. And um, um, so here are some videos just in case it failed. So the way that we did it really is that we, um, there's, a, there's a new API in Wasm it's called WASINN. WASINN is an abstraction that's set on top of uh, CUDA or, or, Metro, or, or Metal or, or, or all those GPU drivers. So basically you write applications to that API and it's compiled to WASM, stays in that API. But at the wrong time, 
the WASM runtime detects what's underneath it, whether it has CUDA 11 available, CUDA 12 available, or it has metal available, you know, or it has some other, you know, uh, uh, Intel instruction set available. And at real time, it's, uh, when it runs the application, it translates that into GPU instructions and have it running on the GPU, right? So it's a, it's a fairly straightforward way to do it. You know, you just provide a compatibility layer for application developers. So as application developers, you no longer need to worry about what's underneath it. The trade-off, of course, is that the, the ops people becomes, has to be more, has to do more. You know, it's, a, it's like you're installing an operating system, then you have to install the GPU drivers because, you know, as far as I'm concerned, you know, that's the operating system. It's something that has to match the hardware. If you have the hardware, but you don't install the drivers, then, you know, you're not installing the operating system. Is that? So, you know, so the ops people, it becomes, um, um, you know, so for, for a very long time, we have DevOps as the same, um, you know, responsibility. And, uh, uh, you know, we ask developers to do ops. But I think in the AI era, there are so many, the, the, the underlying hardware becomes so heterogeneous that uh, the ops perhaps becomes, uh, you know, a separate job all over again, right? You know, so peop some people would have to set up the ops, set up the drivers and, you know, things like that. And uh, I want to go back to one slide to show you, you know, what this WASI and so-called WASI and API look like. I don't know if you can, you can see those, but, you know, um, the point I want to make is that it's nothing like metal programming or CUDA programming, whereas you have a lot of tedious, very low-level APIs. The whole application that I've just shown you, the chatbot application, is can be fit into one PDF, uh, PPT slide, and uh, you can still read it. It's not too small for you to read it. So it's on the right, on this side, it's just, uh, you know, you can see uh, all those code are Rust, by the way, but you can do it with JavaScript as well. You know, that's, uh, so you can, you have objects for graph builder, and you, you read in the file name, and you read the file into the model name, and you read the model into the memory, and then you build a context, you know, essentially you load everything into the memory, and then you have a loop. The loop basically take, takes, the, takes the user input, and then, you know, uh, ask the model to generate a response. And once it generates a response to convert that, because the response is an array, is an is a array of numbers, you encode that into language and then give it back to you and then ask you to, to, to ask another question. So at the top, it just says user, right? You know, and then, you know, then when the model responds, it says box, and then, you know, or assistant. Yeah. All right, sorry. Okay, all right. So this is, um, so, so what I'm, I'm trying to say is a really simple code for you to, um, so, uh, uh, for the developers. And then uh, the operators, you know, the, the people who do the IT operation should be able to, um, you know, install the right drivers and the right runtimes on their hardware, right? So uh, I think I have maybe three minutes left. So um, I have shown you all the stuff that's, you know, um, uh, that runs WASM Edge, that's a uh, command line, chatbot, and all that. Um, there's, um, um, people keep asking me, you know, is there a, is there a cross-platform GUI application that I can try? You know, that's, I don't want to install uh, those things by hand like you just did with the command line and all that. So um, we're happy to, to report there's a new open source project, and I think um, it's, uh, you know, there's, um, um, you know, it's a, it's a combination of several large open source communities. One is a cross-platform um, Rust UI community is called Rubius, and one is a Wasm Edge community. So they provide the cross-platform user interface using Rust. We provide the cross-GPU an inference engine that's embedded into this application. So there's a, there's a, so the result of this application is called Moshi, and uh, it's, uh, um, it has reached the alpha release. It's all open source, all on GitHub. So you can install it for the Mac, you can install it for Linux. Um, actually, I didn't have the link, but you can, if you go to the repository, you can also install it for Windows. And uh, um, I don't think I really have time to, uh, to, to, to demonstrate this, but you know, it's a, um, the user interface looks like something like that. So you go there and it gives you a list of models that you can choose from. And when you choose a model, it, um, it gives you a chatbot interface. You can, you can interact with the model. You can actually uh, switch to a different model in the, in the middle of the chat, you know, so I started with, uh, so I wouldn't have the problem that I, I just had, right? You know, I just, uh, um, you know, in, in fact, the, the, the demo that didn't work really made my point is that different models has very different capabilities. So you really need to build your application around the model, not build the application side by side with the model because on the API provider, on the sidecar of the model provider, they can upgrade the model at any time. They would think, 
Lama point three point one and Lama three are the same, you know, all very similar. But in fact, for the use case of translation, they are they are drastically different, right? So machine has um, allows you to um, uh, switch between models and embed your model into your application and allow. So you know, so there's um, um, many models you can choose from, and then you can optimize for that. I, I know it's a little too small for you to read, but you know, uh, if you are interested, just uh, you know, go to um, go to this GitHub repository and click on, the, click on the releases, and then you can download the the installer package for Mac, uh, for Windows, and for um, you know, for Linux, and, and and try this yourself. Anyway, so that's that's all I have, and uh, I think my time is almost up. And uh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, yes, please. What we're trying to do and what we're looking forward to doing in the future for our company is we write software for doctors and we're going to be implementing LLM, but most likely we'll be implementing it on server side because they access the application through a web browser or through an EHR or some application. What are your thoughts on actually getting edge LLMs or SLMs onto like a browser, for instance, or on their machines when they log in? The, the the LLM comes in through a CDN or something like that, and they can imp interact through uh, the LLM as fast as you're able to interact with the GPU there. What, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, I think so. I, I think it's, uh, in the device use cases, you have to pre-download the LLMs. I think you can't stream the LLM, um, because I, um, we had another demo that used uh, one of the smallest LLMs that we can find, which is Alibaba's Chenwen. It's only have half a billion parameters, you know, instead of seven billion. The, the you know so you only have a half a billion, but even that model uh, after quanti quantized you still have a half a giga gigabytes of space right. you know so you can't stream it on in the browser but Chrome is is bundling a large language model in that in, in the browser itself right you know so you sort of you pre download it that way yeah yeah that's 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 a good point so you would need some form of operations or operational team or have them download a LLM in advance before yeah got it got it okay. Thanks. Or, or you distribute a client-side application like this and bundle your large language model in that to say, please install this, right? You know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We could all, always package our, our releases yeah. like that. Okay, thanks. Company that has already adopted this kind of like. Um, runtime in their production environment. Um, yeah, so you know it's uh, so we have uh, we have a lot of users for um, um, for the um, production use case. We have a, a, a we have a large collaborator called uh, called Gaia GaiaNet. You know, so what they do is they build personalized knowledge agents. So basically, um, every one of us is good at something, right? You know, that's uh, because maybe I'm good at physics. You know, so I want to turn my physics knowledge into a knowledge base and then have the model to interact with other people on my behalf, right? You know, that's, uh, for instance, my son, who's, uh, who's in middle school, built a chemistry bot together with another author, right? That, that, that other author wrote a, a, a chemistry textbook. So he turned that into a knowledge base and uh, run a large language model around that knowledge base, build a whole application and make it available in Discord. That's uh, you know so his his peer students would be able to ask questions about that you know the, so you know so there's um, people who's working on those um, those knowledge networks and uh, you know and for those use cases you need uh, each use case you need a different model because sometimes you need to fine tune the model you need to make the model to speak like a teacher for instance and you definitely need the custom knowledge that be injected into the model so that the model speak reliably about the chemi chemistry elements you know so to give you a, just to drag it a little longer um, the reason that we did it is because he asked the model question what is mercury the model uh, chat GPT said mercury is the innermost planet of a solar system blah 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 but he's not asking for mercury as a planet he's asking for mercury as an element right you know so he's, he clarified his question what, what about the element then the chat GPT answered it correctly for several rounds and then he asked What's the melting temperature of mercury? We already knew the mercury is liquid at room temperature, so the melting temperature must be very low. But ChatGPT answer is 400 Fahrenheit. So, at, um, you know, for the longest time, I couldn't figure out why ChatGPT answered that. Then I realized 
the surface temperature of Mercury, the planet, is 400 Fahrenheit. Okay, so you can see with all the knowledge that in the in the large language model, it's come, it's hallucinates, you know, um, by mixing those facts together, right? You know, so to build a custom build model with a custom build knowledge base, package them together in an application, I think has tremendous value because that's really you know reduces the type of, you know, the, the type of you know uncertain answers or the hallucinations that the model provides to you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, and um, you know, um, enjoy your enjoy your weekend. Yeah.